Hello and welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, co-president and co-founder of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. On today's show, we're going to talk about white evangelical racism in January 6th. And we have a very special expert guest to introduce in a minute. But before we introduce her, I'm also so pleased to have with me as co-host Cheris Horde, who's making her first appearance on this show. Cheris Horde is our hardworking governmental affairs intern who works closely with Mark Dan, our governmental affairs director based in DC. Uh, Cheris is there in Ohio. Welcome to uh, Ask an Atheist, Cheris. Hello, I am so happy to be here. Hi, time. And Chara, since this is your first time on Ask an Atheist, can you please tell us just a little bit about yourself and what you've been working on for FFRF? Of course. So I am an Ohio native, and I'm currently based out of Toledo, Ohio. I am a recent graduate of Bowling Green State University with my Master of Public Administration degree. As for FFRF, I assist the governmental affairs team with background research on legislation and regulations. Well, that's wonderful. You've been wonderful help. And so let's begin the show. We're devoting today's program to white evangelical racism. And uh, we have as a special guest, uh, uh, Professor Anthea Butler. And um, it would be helpful if I had the teleprompter working for me here. <laughs> um, and we are very honored to have uh, Dr. Anthea Butler with me. She's chair of the Department of Religious Studies and the Geraldine R. Siegel Professor of American Social Thought at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also the author of White Evangelical Racism. That's a book. I think we have an image of it showing. And Women in the Church of God in Christ, Making a Sanctified World. She's also a contributor to the 1619 Project. Dr. Butler is also a contributing author in the seminal report on white Christian nationalism and the January 6th insurrection that was produced by FFRF and the Baptist Joint Committee. Dr. Butler gives a much needed insight on white Christian nationalism from the perspective of being a black American. And as a black American myself, who grew up Christian and experienced a lot of racism throughout my life from white Christians, I really do appreciate Dr. Butler's deep dives into how racist values are seemingly interwoven with religious beliefs at times. I've admired Dr. Butler's work for years, and her book, White Evangelical Racism, is available in FRF's online shop, and it's very eye-opening. And you can find Dr. Butler on Twitter, um, at Anthea Butler. So welcome, Dr. Butler. It is great to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you both. If you have questions for Dr. Butler, you can ask them in the Facebook comments or send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. And yes, this show is called Ask an Atheist, but today we also have a question for you. Do you think there is a disconnect between Christian teachings and evangelical political actions? You can put your answer in the comments and we might read it on the air, assuming it's family friendly. And remember, FFRF is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization, so we don't take sides in partisan elections. We don't necessarily uh, endorse any of the views that might be expressed here. And so uh, today we um, really want to get down to the nuts and bolts of what white Christian nationalism is. Um, Dr. Butler, can you explain? You know, I, I think the way to explain white Christian nationalism is, is very simple. Uh, basically, it's the idea that Christianity is entwined both with the uh, founding of America and America's destiny, and that white people play a very important part in it, and that they are the ones who are the inheritors of this tradition. In other words, white Christian nationalists could come in a lot of variety of forms and variations, but what we saw on January 6th was something very different and something that has been escalating with evangelicals and others and fundamentalists for a long time. And I think that 1-6 um, really brought that out in a different kind of way. But we've had Christian nationalism with us for a long time. So your newest book, White, Christ in, uh, White Evangelical Racism, you discuss the longstanding legacy of the evangelical movement mixed with the racist elements that 
uh, have shaped the evangelical community's beliefs and practices. So first, can you talk about your own experiences within the evangelical community and how those experiences inspired you to write this book? And do you consider yourself an evangelical today? Well, first, I'm going to tell you that I'm not an evangelical today. That is um, something I want to put there out there up front. I was baptized and raised Catholic, had a little time in the evangelical church, and came out of that um, during my doctoral work. So I think that's the first thing to say to everybody. It is also very always interesting to me that when I write things like this, that um, people always are curious about what my religious beliefs are. As a historian, you know, there's there's always going to be bias. You always have to think about where you come from. But I think in this particular case, for me, it was much easier to write this book because I did understand evangelicalism. And I could talk about some of the insights and beliefs that I think a lot of people have not noticed. So that's the second part. The third part is I think that there's a, there's a misnomer about evangelicalism and that you know, how does this start? How do we think about this? And there's always different ways to talk about this. So I'll, I'll talk about it in this way. People start off with sort of a belief system, what they think about scripture. And then that belief system has to hit the culture. And then when it hits the culture, then it becomes time for people to think about how those beliefs interact with culture and how they use those beliefs to give themselves a leg up in culture. And I think one of the things that's important about my book is this history of how evangelicals have used both scripture their beliefs and the culture to give themselves a prominent position, not only religiously, but politically. So Cheris, you, you, you've got the next question there. So was the evangelical church based on racist beliefs? And if so, are there any specific instances that you can point out to all of us? Well, <laughs> let me put it to you like this, without getting into a bigger discussion and going back a little bit further than, the, than I do in the beginning of the book, I would say this, everything starts off with something that is benign. In other words, a belief system that people have, right? Then it, it hits the culture, just like I talked about, and then it becomes racist. So in this particular instance, where we're talking about evangelicalism, evangelicalism and racism, specifically evangelicalism and slavery, interacted with each other. And that is what I deal with in the introduction and the first chapter of my book, to talk about how people took those evangelical beliefs and used them to justify slavery, to justify you know, inferiority of people from African descent and all these other things. So if you're asking me, does it start off with just racism? It's not just racism, it's a lot of different things that go into it, but racism definitely becomes a part of it. And you know, just to say this as a teacher, and the way that I always think about this, if you wanna read a really good chapter about the genealogy of modern racism, I think one of the best chapters ever has been from um, Cornel West's book, Prophesied Deliverance, where he talks about the genealogy of modern racism, because you have to understand racism not just as a thing, but the philosophical that, that people don't talk about racism in the traditional sense that we do now, but they do talk about inferiority of cultures and races, and that kind of racial hierarchy begins with the Enlightenment. Could you repeat the name of that book you recommend? It's called Prophesied Deliverance by Cornell West. It was published in the early 1980s. Thank you. For the evangelical community today, how do they kind of reckon with this racist foundation? Is there a desire within that community to have an honest examination of that past? Well, let me let me put it like this. It, and the evangelical community is not a monolith, first of all. So there's different parts of the community that are trying to deal with it, but there's a lot of that community that does not give a damn about dealing with it, okay? So that's number one. And, and that's the part of the community I'm talking about, the part of the community that doesn't care about that. And so when we're talking about that, we have to think about people like John MacArthur, who recently on Twitter have been, uh, people been sharing back and forth a whole um, sermon of his where he talks about how slavery was you know, ordained by the Bible and how black people were inferior and all this kind of stuff. You have varying degrees of racist belief within evangelicalism. What I try to do in the book is to give you sort of a ley line to say, here are the ways in which evangelicals have appropriated racism for their own kinds of political gain and purposes and the ways in which that has a, has something to do with it. So you have two kind of evangelicals now. You have the kind of evangelicals who are like, well, you know, I believe in Donald Trump and I love him and this is this is the way it is. And then you have the other evangelicals who are dismayed and don't want to be seen as racist, but also have bought into racist ideals for years. 
So in chapter three of White Evangelical Racism, you discussed this concept of colorblind gospel and how white evangelicals held the expectation that non-white uh, believers would adopt and assimilate into the viewpoints of white evangelical members and leadership. Cheris, I think you wanted to respond. You had another follow-up there. For me, I noticed the same sentiment in the atheist community where non-white atheists are expected to adopt and conform to the viewpoints of the white atheist community. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to ask you was, do you think that it's accurate uh, white atheist mindset um, that deconverting from religious beliefs absolves them from the racist actions and beliefs that we've sometimes seen in the modern atheist community where there is a secular far right movement occurring? You know, I'm gonna say this is the question that the atheists are probably not gonna like that I'm gonna answer it this way. But atheists have religious beliefs too. They just may not be religious about them, but they also have tribal behaviors or whatever you want to call it that make them act a certain kind of way. So just as much as evangelicals expect people who come into the fold to behave like them, atheists are to think the same thing. And I think one of the things that was very prescient <clears throat> that a person who um, blurred my book, Julie Ingersoll, who's a professor at Florida International University, I believe, I'm sorry if I'm messing this up. She said basically that evangelical beliefs permeate all parts of our culture, whether you believe them or not. And, and that way it shapes people's behavior. And I think that was really important for her to say, because you know, as someone who is a non-believer herself, one of the things I think is really important is to understand that these religious beliefs, the religion kind of ways in which big you know, things like evangelicalism sort of impose upon the culture also make you behave in certain kinds of ways because you want to backlash that. You don't want to be a part of it. And so just as much as evangelicals are religious about their political beliefs, I think atheists can be religious about their ways in which they think about a religion and be the kinds of behaviors that they might want people who come into the fold who are different than, you know, other than white, uh, may behave and may want to have relationship with those communities that they've left, even though that their people are still believers. What can the white atheist community do to essentially deconvert from racism and white supremacy? That's a big question. And, you know, I think one of the, one of the things I think is really important is to sort of realize that just as much as as this white supremacy is a religious thing is to realize how does white supremacy work in the atheist community? How do you position or what is your positionality relative to other uh, other people of ethnic origin in the, in atheism, first of all? And then secondarily, how are you responding politically and socially to the things that are happening in this country right now? I think that's a really important spot to begin with, I, you know, I wouldn't say that every atheist was racist, just like I wouldn't say every evangelical was racist. But I do think there are ways in which we buy into these kind of cultural norms that allow our lives to be comfortable. It's, it's easy to scoff at, let, let me put it this way, it's easy to scoff at black Christians who are for Black Lives Matter and are trying to do stuff because you're thinking, oh, they don't need to, you know, why do they need God, right? But I also think that it's important to understand that that is their way, or their focus of thinking about how to process justice in a particular kind of way. And it doesn't make them any less than somebody who doesn't believe. If you have questions for Dr. Butler, you can ask them in the Facebook comments or send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. And um, you can also respond to the comments. Do you think there is a disconnect between Christian teachings and evangelical political activity? Now, when you were writing White Evangelical Racism, Dr. Butler, did you imagine that Trumpism and white Christian nationalism would collide to create that horrible violence that we witnessed on January 6th? They had already collided when he came down the escalator. Actually, they actually <laughs> collided beforehand. They collided beforehand with birtherism back in 2012. Yeah. So, you know, I, it's, it's not that I was surprised. I think what I was surprised about you know, was that they were dumb enough to go to the Capitol, right? And not to, and to think that that was going to be successful in this very, you know, raggedy way that they did it. I mean, it was awful, obviously, watching that during the, when it was happening. But I also think that none of us who study any of this were surprised by what happened. None of us. What is the connection between January 6th and the desire for white Christians to hold on to power? Well, they think Donald Trump is their God. 
And I mean, you know, not in a small g kind of way, they believe that he's divinely, you know, appointed. And so they believe that holding that keeps them holding on to power. He gave them everything they wanted. I mean, I think this is what people miss in the media and other spaces is that Donald Trump delivered. And that's hard to say, but he delivered three, you know, justices. He did everything he said he was going to do for evangelicals. He did it for them. They voted for him. And the bargain was kept. And so when you have somebody like that, you obviously want them to stay in power. And I believe that they will do whatever they need to do to get him back into power, because that they are inextricably linked. They are together now. There's no separation. There's no daylight between evangelicals and Donald Trump right now. And for those who are leaving, they need to call themselves something else, basically. Why do so many evangelicals sidestep their religious beliefs and instead thirst for power in that way? Oh, see, but that's where the question's wrong. They're not sidestepping their religious beliefs. This goes right along with their religious beliefs. This is about authoritarianism and patriarchy. And so these are part of their belief systems. It's not stepping aside their religious beliefs. This is the one thing, if I don't say anything else today, I want people to understand. Don't be fooled by the fact that they keep saying they love Jesus. Their Jesus is militarized and ready to shoot everybody, okay? And they're about power. This is not about morality, okay? For, because everybody has thought it was morality. And I, what, the reason why I titled this book The Politics of Morality in America is because this is a political ploy. It's not about real morality. They can always be forgiven of a sin. <laughs> it, you, it, if you take this seriously, you miss the point about what the game is. And I think that's the biggest thing that I think that anybody who wants to read this book, you should take away from this the fact that you've been duped and bamboozled by a group of people who told you morality mattered, when in fact it only matters for them to beat you over the head with it. Uh, where do you think this thirst for power is going to be channeled uh, in a post-insurrection society? We're not post-insurrection. Right. Good answer. <laughs> I said, let's get let's let's go number one. We're not post insurrection, and number two, it's going to happen again, and, and th this is not going to stop. You have people who are heavily armed, organized, with pastors who are whipping them up every Wednesday and Sunday. You know, I think about Greg Locke and all those people, and so this is not this is not over. Democracy is failing, and we never really had one because we didn't have democracy for black people and a whole bunch of other people in this country. And so now what white people are now finding out, atheists or believer, is that this democracy is fragile and it's on the skids. And I don't think I can say it any stronger than that. Well, you're right. It is frightening. Um, as of today, the January 6th committee has not drawn the connection between white Christian nationalism and January 6th. And of course, you participated in that report that FFRF and the Baptist Joint Committee produced. And thank you for that. Um, what do you think they should be doing? Well, it's a it's a very dangerous game that, that they're having to line. It's a very dangerous line to have to walk. And basically, the moment they start talking about religion, that gives all of these uh, evangelicals a way to say they're attacking us because of our faith. Yeah. You know, right? And so what you have to do is figure out how to talk about religion in such a way where it's part of the conversation but it's not the, the whole sole cause, you know? And so I think the way that they've been going so far is good, where they are showing a lot of this has to do with Trump and how this was very organized in certain kinds of ways. Now, if they begin to talk about the Jericho march that happened in December and the ways in which all these pastors came together to pray, then I think, you know, that helps with the argument. That just adds, you know, some layers on top of it. But do I think they can, you know, do a whole day on this? Not at all, because I think it would really actually backfire in ways that it shouldn't. I think it should be part of the record. I think it's an important part of what prosecutions might be. But can they do that in the TV time? Probably not. Yeah, I, I think you're right. You quoted General Michael Flynn in, in the piece you did for the January 6th report, saying that if we're going to have one nation under God, which we must, we have to have one religion, one religion under God and one religion under God. Uh, so what do you think Flynn's statement um, means uh, for the separation of church and state? Uh, uh, <laughs> let me just say, yesterday's Supreme Court decision will let you know that there's no separation of church and state. 
And I would have said long before Michael Flynn said this, that there's no separation of church and state. We always say that there's no religious test, right? There's religious tests all the time for politicians. There's religious tests about everything. There's a religious test just to be president so you know how to say God bless America after every speech you give. It, there's, there's no separation. I mean, Thomas Jefferson and that letter to Danbury is like a, a piece of archaic thing that people bring out to talk about the separation between church and state that doesn't exist in America. Well, you're so right. I mean, Sonia Sotomayor said today it's a violation of the Constitution to have separation of church and state in her dissent on this yeah. main voucher case. It's so distressing. Yeah, very distressing. I mean, I think that the main voucher case opens up a whole can of worms and, you know, this very Catholic court is going to be a mess and it's going to continue to be a mess. And I think that, you know, there's some unintended consequences about that main voucher case that they're going to have to deal with. But because they're thinking just about Christians, but, you know, we can start to think about Muslims and others who might want to start schools and like say, hey, where's my vouchers? Where's my stuff? And are they going to be are they going to be treated equally or not? That's the question. I don't know. So to no one's surprise, Dr. Butler has sparked a lot of conversation online. And here's what people are saying and asking. So, yes, so let me see what we have, and it'll just take me a second here to open this. What haven't we talked about, Professor Butler, that you want to add? I think I should add two things. One is people need to really pay attention to the fact that churches have been radicalized. And what I mean by that is, you know, we, we tell, you know, people throw away these things like, oh, you know, evangelicals are the Taliban and all this stuff. So I'm like, no, 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 no. It's different. The Taliban are organized. This is this is disorganized in ways that are organized. And what I mean by that is you have so many of these people saying so many different things with so many different kinds of strains of, you know, religious beliefs and kind of conspiracy theories that are mixing up into this, that this is going to become a very messy situation. And I believe that we're in a time that is increasingly volatile between um, how COVID has panned out with these communities, how the recession is panning out, how inflation is panning out, how all of these things are kind of coalescing together. And so we can expect, you know, religious violence. I think that is really important to say. And while I do not like saying that, I think that it would be naive to ignore the fact that one six in a way was a lot about religious violence and that religious violence can come again in various different kinds of ways. And I guess uh, the whole issue of abortion, which we haven't talked about, mm -hmm. the bans on abortion in a sense are a form of violence. Well, you know? yes, yes. And there were violence that, you know, it's been violent since everybody decided that they were gonna go pro-life, whether we're talking about Randall Terry's or people that blew up, you know, um, split angs or people who shot people like Reginald, you know, Dr. Tiller. I mean, all of this is a piece. And if you think that they're going to stop with, you know, the fall of Roe, you are sorely mistaken. It, it, there are going to be a lot more things that they are coming for. And the thing about it is this. I think that what really gets me is that people just thought they were, they were just, you know, I'm going to say it like this bullshitting all this time, but they were not. They were serious. And they were organized and they did it. And so, you know, when people were wailing about the statement that came out from the court, that was leaked from the court, I just thought, you know, have you not been paying attention to the last 40, 50 years? Where have you been? This has been number one fundraiser, number one organizer, number one vetting point for presidents and politicians on the Republican Party. You cannot be surprised by where we are now because it's been coming for a long time. Yeah, and number one vetting question uh, um, by the Republicans of anybody who was going to be appointed to the federal judiciary. And exactly. that's where they really took over. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have questions. So from Ann Ben Dixon, she asks, what can we do to combat this fake morality and the political ploy? What can we do to um, um, unbamboozle people? Well, I think the first thing you can do is to really, you know, become as, as much as you can politically active. I think that you need to think about the kinds of candidates you back. I think you need to call out, you know, the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party for the ways in which they, you know, enable this. Let me give you a case in point. Henry Quaylar in Texas, who is a, a Democrat who's also a pro-life Democrat, won by only 200 votes. 200 votes. You would have had a liberal Democrat in a, a woman in office 
But instead, what did the Rep Democratic Party do? Support him. And so I think those are the ways that we start to look for 2022 and 2024 is what candidates are you supporting and, and why and what are their platforms? That's number one. Number two is, you know, stop calling people in your family that are like this. I, I, I you know, I, I want to say this specifically to white people here. Like, I know you all have to deal with people in your family that may have these kind of beliefs and you don't want to mess this up because you like, you know, the holidays, what you know, generically, right? But it's time to start talking to people about this. And if they don't like it, it's really too bad. But we're now talking about, you know, a crucial time a time in which we may not have this country like we've known it before. And it's not that this country has ever been perfect, but we're about to slide into a very bad authoritarianism space. And whether you believe in religion or not, it is not going to matter when things start to really ramp up and get crazy like they did in the 30s in Germany. Yeah, you're giving me goose pimples and <laughs> chills because it, it's a uh, uh, very yeah. critical time. Yeah. So we have more questions. Herbert three asks via Twitter, my biggest question is, what do we intend to do about white Christian nationalism? As important as awareness and discussion are, these people will not stop until we place an impassable wedge in their path. When do we get to the wedge? Um, you don't have a strong enough president for the wedge, first of all. Second of all, you don't have a strong enough Congress or Senate, which you're about to lose. So, you know, and basically, let me let me just say to you point blank, you, you're talking about a wedge as though there's gonna be something magical that happens. This is not gonna be magic because guess what? All of these people got involved in the school board. They got involved in local politics. They got involved in the police force. They got involved in all these spaces in which your life is, your everyday life is impacted. And so it, it will take probably a, at least a generation if things go well, and there's no promise that they will, that we can get back to some kind of parody. Because, it, you know, at the very core, the reason why you get to be an atheist is because we, we're, we're supposed to theoretically have freedom of religion and freedom from religion, right? And so if you want that, then you're not gonna be able to tell those people who are in the pews who are saying that you should just kill somebody because they're demonic, and I think that they're demonic, it's going to be very hard to tell those people to stop because that's their space and that's their law. There's their legally, rightfully space to say that. Until they do something that's illegal, you can't do anything about it. So we have more questions. Mark O'Brien, he asks, why do you think that after the Capitol riot, so many people from the religious right try to downplay the violence by saying the Black Lives Matters protests were so much worse, quote unquote, do you really think they actually believe that, or are they just parroting conservative talking points? Both and. You, you can have both things, and both of them can still be true. A, they believe that black people are violent anyway. This is one of the things I talk about in the book and talk about this history of how black people get vilified by evangelicals first. And then secondarily, when you've had your pastor saying that you know Black Lives Matter is Antifa and everything else, you have a mix of racist beliefs and conspiracy theories together, of course they believed it. Of course they signed on to it. I mean, when you have the Archbishop of, you know, of um, Los Angeles, uh, Gomez, saying basically that, you know, Black Lives Matter is a secular movement and that you need to leave it alone because it's, it's trying to make itself a religion, then you have to know that everybody is a little loco, right? And, and this is not sensible. So, yeah, I don't think that you should believe that they don't believe it. They completely believe it. Although, how can they look at those images from nine, uh, from um, January 6th of all the white people crawling over the Capitol and um, battering look, people? Yeah, uh, obviously. I mean, you and I would say, look at look at all these white people, right? They'll say, look at all those people who were, who were um, ops because they believe in conspiracy theories. They're listening to Fox. They're listening to you know, a whole host of people, Alex Jones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When your mind gets warped like this by a constant stream of this kind of material, you will, you will continue to say these things in order to belong to the group that you belong to. And I think this is one of the most important things I could say is that while this may look, you know, absolutely crazy to us and absolutely just like, how can you believe this when the evidence is right in front of your eyes? They're not believing that. They're believing the people that they believe, not not what is you know rational. 
alternative facts. It's what they're believing, huh? Yes. So we have a final question. Can we do anything to protect against religious violence? Can we do anything to minimize its effects? Um, I don't know. I, I have to tell you that religion is the driver of so much violence right now in the world that I don't know that there's anything that is a mitigating possibility in this country until we figure out how to get a handle on guns. It, we, you cannot do anything in this country to mitigate any kind of violence without some kind of restricted gun laws. But right now we have so many guns in circulation that it's it's impossible. I mean, you can make you can make a gun with a 3D printer. So I don't know that that's the question to ask. I think maybe the question to ask is how do we uh, make our uh, lawmakers and people who are understand that this is a very present danger and that they should be better prepared for this than they already than they have been. I mean, you would not have what had happened at the Capitol had they not been watching certain kind of channels and 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 making sure that you know things were protected that day. There was so much chatter up to this that they just ignored. I mean, this is why you left with the skeleton crew, or maybe that was you know purposeful at the Capitol. But you know, honestly, you 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 had to know something was going to happen. So we don't like to leave uh, viewers without any hope. Um, I know, right? Some con how, how about a conclusion? I know that you're saying we have to vote, uh, we have to pay attention. Um, wh where's the hope here? I mean, I think the hope here is, you know, two things. One is we have to hope that the system is not so broken that we begin to see some prosecutions more than just the people who stormed the Capitol, okay? That's number one. This is this is a criminal conspiracy. If the if the cabal is not broken, then you're going to have this happen again. That's number one. Number two is you you have to really hope that you know at some point that the rest of America will wake up. And and what I mean by that is this is that people get so disgusted in the space that we're in right now that they will begin to fight back. I am the person who would say. We need to be in the streets. It's not just about being in the streets because of Black Lives Matter, which has been the biggest movement that, you know, since basically Occupy we've had. But there's glimmers of hope. There's the, the union organizing that's happening, all of these kinds of things. And I'm just hopeful that the financial situation will, will help people to start thinking about how to coalesce together in groups and to really push back against all of this. I think, you know, the problem on the liberal side is that we tend to be, you know, too nice about things. You know, Republicans ain't never nice about anything. They are of one accord and they march in lockstep or duck step, if you want to call it that. But I think that that's a problem for liberals and, and those who are people of goodwill who think that the status quo is just always going to remain. It's not always going to remain. And I think that if you want it to remain, if you want to think about what I mean by status quo here is not, you know, racial hierarchies. What I mean is, you know, civil life and civil society, you have to fight for that. And right now, I'm not sure people even understand that that is so is so deeply under threat in America. I think that concludes our Ask an Atheist. All right. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Butler, for being here. Your wisdom and insight on this topic is never more needed. We're very grateful to you for taking the time to speak with us today. Yes, we are so grateful for everything you've done and for your writings, and we hope we'll be in touch soon. Sure thing. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And also this week on Free Thought Radio, FFRF's weekly radio show and podcast at ffrf.org slash radio, Dan and I are speaking with uh, one of our attorneys. We're not sure which one to dissect this very bad decision we talked about this week by the Supreme Court to abandon decades of legal doctrine separating religion and government in that case involving vouchers to religious schools in Maine. And next week on Ask an Atheist, FFRF attorneys Rebecca Market and Liz Cavell will talk about that case and possibly others, depending on what the court hands down between now and then. So it's a very worrying time for our nation given the supermajority of extremists on the Supreme Court. So if you want more information about the Freedom from Religion Foundation, go to our website, ffrf.org. If you're a member already, thank you. If not, please join us and see you next time on FFRS Ask an Atheist. <laughs>